What's up guys and welcome to the Foot and Fist Sports Network where today we're going to be talking about UFC 197's Fight Fallout. Basically it's a show where we go over where the UFC and the fighters who were in the bigger fights of the card should go from now. Um, let's start off with John Bones Jones. You know, he made a good return against Ovin St. Pru. It wasn't the best performance, but realistically his future is already clear. He's going to be facing Daniel Cormier well, either at UFC 200 or at the first event at Madison Square Garden in New York City. The question is, is Daniel Cormier's doctor going to clear him to be training immediately, or is it going to have to take a little bit longer based on his leg injury? He's going to be basically getting it checked out within the next couple days, and we'll know soon enough what he's going to be doing. Uh, I expect that if they do, if he is healthy, they're just going to put him on UFC 200 because they need a big headliner to take the place of Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz. You know, John Jones versus DC is a grudge match. It's a it, There's a big rivalry between them. They both hate each other. So there's no doubt that that fight would sell pretty well at UFC 200. Uh, Daniel Cormier was very open about the fact that he wasn't impressed with John Jones' performance. And he's very confident. John Jones obviously flipped him off. You know, it's just... The buildup is going to be great. Both guys do not like each other, and that is where they're. That's where John Jones is going to be going. It's just a matter of where they're going to have it next. And I really do think that either way, if they do do it at UFC 200 or at Madison Square Garden, the events are going to be very special either way. You know, if they have it at UFC 200, that would make John Jones the only fighter to have been to have fought on both UFC 100 and UFC 200. So very impressive, very important, uh, very important stat for John Jones. Just from a you know, a history point of view. If they do fight at you in, in the first Madison, the first event in Madison Square Garden, it will also be interesting for John Jones, basically because he is a New Yorker. He's from New York State, so it'd be a hometown fight. It would be huge. You know, New York is renowned for how they back their local guys, and it'll be interesting to see if that's what happened. Obviously, Daniel Cormier would love to be in Madison Square Garden as well. Maybe not against John Jones as the first fight on. That, in that arena, but I'm assuming it would be an interesting uh, idea for DC as well. Next up, guys, I'm going to talk about Ovin St. Preux. You know, hats off to Ovin St. Preux for taking that fight on short notice with John Jones and really going to the fifth round even with a broken arm. For those two reasons, I think that OSP didn't really lose anything when it comes to his stock. You know, people are going to know that he's a tough guy and the UFC are going to owe him a big favor because he took the fight. And just in general, you know, it was a very good performance. He didn't really provide anything dangerous to John Jones other than a few hits here and there. But it was one of those things where you really see that a guy is tough. And just considering how his cardio wasn't going to be on point because of how much time he had to train, I think that he's going to be in title contention soon enough. And I would, I think, actually, I would love to see him fight Alexander Gustafson next. Both guys are coming off of a title shot loss. And I think that if, you know, both guys would use, could definitely use a win over the other. You know, if Ovin St. Preux were to beat Alexander Gustafson, he would be in the running to face either John Jones or Daniel Cormier for the next title shot. Not necessarily the one between, basically between Glover Teixeira and Anthony Romwa Johnson, but the one after that. If Alexander Gustafson were to win, the same exact thing. You know, Gustafson does have a loss over both uh, John Jones and Daniel Cormier, but they were both legendary fights. So either way, I think the UFC has plenty of room to sell the fights, and they would be very interesting, very interested in both fighters actually making another title run in the near future. Uh, next up, guys, I want to talk about um, the disappointing performance by Anthony Pettis against Essen Barboza. You know, Anthony Pettis just just about a year, a year and a half ago, he was on top of the world. He was the first MMA fighter to be on a Wheaties box, and he was really looking like one of those fighters who's going to be at the top of his division for a very long time. But now he's on a three-fight losing streak, and he is really looking like a guy who needs to make some big changes in his game. You know, he just seems to lack that that killer instinct, and he seems to just not, you know, squeeze the trigger and just release the barrage of attacks that we've seen him do in his in his fights that have really made him great. You know, that's that's a big thing that he's that he just seems to have lost in his game, and it'll be interesting to see if he can sort of find that back. But I think he has two. Very interesting options for what he can do next in his career. Number one, he can stay at lightweight and take on a guy like Michael Johnson or uh, Michael Chiesa or even a Nate Diaz if Nate Diaz would be willing to take that fight and sort of get himself back into contention at the weight class that he probably feels is his own. Or 
and this is what I think would probably be the most interesting thing to see, he could drop down to 145 if he can make the weight, obviously. He could drop down to 145 and take on a guy like maybe a Max Holloway who would give him a striking fight and would give him the opportunity to show his striking against someone who's smaller and who, who isn't going to try to overpower him against the fence like, say, Eddie Alvarez or Rofredo Dos Anjos. And I just think it would be a very interesting chance for Anthony Pettis to, to basically start with a clean slate and have a chance to show what he still has. Going against guys that don't have the advantages that 155-pound guys have over him. So more strength, you know, better wrestling, just things like that. It would be an interesting opportunity, and I would like to see whether he's going to go sooner rather than later. I mean, he has some big improvements to make in his game, and I would like to see where he's going to go soon. Uh, next up, I want to talk about Edson Barboza, guys. He had a tremendous performance against Anthony Pettis. He looked like a, one of those guys who is really sort of, sort of putting things together. He has great striking, and, you know, he's just he's, he looks like a guy that could really compete in the top three, top four guys in the lightweight division. We, you know, we all know at lightweight, any given day, any given fighter could really make that extra leap and just take that belt. Edson Barboza is one of those guys now. You know, I would like to see him fight Dan, uh, Donald Cerrone in a rematch because I think that was one of his less less brilliant performances you know he got he got finished in an awkward way it was just kind of weird the way it ended and I think he would probably have a pretty good chance of getting a rematch I think him and Donald Cerrone match up really well um just stylistically and I think that that would be a very interesting fight to see in a you know in the opening fight or maybe the second or third fight of a card in a big card maybe mm, he's fighting Tim Means at 170 so maybe not too soon, but after that, I would love to see Edson Barbosa versus Cowboy Cerrone go at it one more time. Next up, guys, I'm going to talk about Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson, who had one of the best performances of his career, if not the very best performance he's had so far. He went up against a, a very tough opponent, Henry Cejudo, who presented some problems to the table. You know, he had good, he had Olympic level wrestling, he had a pretty good clinch game, and Demetrius Johnson went out there and he humbled Cejudo. He hit him with some devastating knees from crazy angles in the clinch of where Cejudo expected to be at his best. And he finished him with a, you know, he hit him with a with a brutal shot to the liver. And then he finished him. He followed him up with a shot to the head with another knee as, he stu as Cejudo stumbled across the octagon. And it was just one of those performances that really showed you that Demetrius Johnson is, if not the best fighter in, in the world and of all time, he is right there with John Jones. He's probably neck and neck with John Jones. It'll be interesting to see as both of their careers progress, who is going to really cement themselves as the greatest of all time. Now, what, where should Demetrius Johnson go from now? Well, if you look at his division, there's not really a legit number one contender other than maybe Joseph Benavidez. But Joseph Benavidez has two losses to Demetrius already, one of which was a very devastating knockout in, I think, the first round. So... Demetrius probably should probably take a little bit of time and see who can cement themselves as the legit number one contender. What I would like to see would be Demetrius Johnson versus Dominic Cruz in a super fight at either 130 or 135. I think Demetrius Johnson would have a really good chance of avenging his loss to Dominic Cruz from a couple years from a few years ago. And I just think that would be probably the the pinnacle of excellence when it comes to light light fighters. It would be the very best the very the two very best fighters you could put in when it comes to a super a super a super fight at those you know two or three weight classes and I think it would be a tremendous fight to see I actually think Demetrius probably win that fight as well and then see where he could go with the title defenses in his weight class um, he's very close to beating Anderson Silva's record of most title defensive defenses and I think he's going to get that pretty soon and there's no doubt that he'll be the flyweight champion for a very very long time. Next up, let's talk about Henry Cejudo, who went out there. He had very high hopes of winning the title. Uh, I think it was probably, you know, premature. He didn't quite have as much of a game as I as I think he probably thought he did. Demetrius is perfect everywhere, and that's something that Henry Cejudo had to witness firsthand. He underestimated Demetrius' clinch, and it cost him. Where should Henry Cejudo go from here? Probably fight, fighting Joseph Benavidez to decide who is the legit number one contender. Those are the two guys that can really compete to decide who is the actual number one contender and I just think that those are the two best guys besides um, Demetrius Johnson maybe even Ian McCall is in that running but I just think that those that Ian McCall is on a couple fight losing streak and he needs to get himself back into contention 
Uh, I think that it would be a very interesting matchup. Those guys have been scheduled to fight each other before, I think twice actually, and for some reason Henry Cejudo has never ended up actually fighting John Joseph Benavidez. Seems kind of fishy. A lot of people will sort of suspect that he's been ducking Benavidez, and I don't think that's quite completely out of the picture. And I think that's probably the best fight that you could put on that they could put on in the flyweight division when it comes to contenders. Next up, guys, I just want to talk about Yair Rodriguez. You know, what a performance he had against Andre Tuchifili, a guy who is very tough. He has good, good, good wrestling, good striking, and he prevents a lot of, you know, a lot of problems with his creativity. Yair Rodriguez went out there. He put on a tremendous performance, and he got a beautiful head kick knockout, one of the one of the best head knockouts in UFC history. Where could he go on from here? I think he should probably take in, take on a top 13, top 12 opponent. I think Brian Ortega, who is 25 years old, would be an excellent opponent for Yair Rodriguez. Both guys are very young and are great prospects, and it would be very interesting to see what Rodriguez could do against a guy who has a very complete game for his age. You know, he's got good wrestling, good striking, and it would be very interesting to see what, Ortega, what Rodriguez could do against a guy like Brian Ortega. Could he get himself closer to being in the top 10, and really put himself in contention for a featherweight title shot. I think that within the next two, three years, maybe even less actually, just based on how good his kicking game is, those kicks are re- really are game changers. And it's, it's one of those things, you know, will he be able to cement himself as one of the better performers at that weight class? I think he will. And the fact that he's bilingual and he's just such a likable guy will make him a very, very big figure in the UFC's you know, title picture, and just as a, as a guy who's going, and as an ambassador for the sport towards Mexico and towards Latin America, I think he's going to be one of those guys who's really going to take the UFC even farther from where they are now. All right, guys, let me know in the comments section down below who you think these guys should take on, if you agree with the things I said. Uh, If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button, and please subscribe. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.